Ken Mattingly and Hank Hartsfield are making final preparations to fly the spaceship Columbia on its last test flight and first military mission come Sunday. They are the topic in John Getter's report tonight on the fourth flight of Columbia, the end of the beginning. Henry W. Hartsfield, Jr., Hank, is at age 48, retired from the Air Force, an astronaut with 13 years service, and a space rookie. A former fighter and test pilot, Hank Hartsfield first came close to space flight in the late 60s as part of the Air Force Manned Orbiting Laboratory Program. When it was canceled, he transferred to NASA. While still an Air Force astronaut, he served in the support crews for Apollo 16, flown by his shuttle commander, Ken Mattingly, and on Skylab missions 2, 3, and 4. Hartsfield is a quietly serious man, a scientist pilot, who has done extensive work in physics and astronautics. He and Mattingly have been the designated backup crew for the previous shuttle flights. Thomas K. Mattingly III, Ken, is a space veteran. The Navy jet pilot and aeronautical engineer is 46 and has been an astronaut since 1966. He worked on support crews for Apollo missions 8 and 11, both moon flights, and was slated as the command module pilot for the ill-fated Apollo 13 flight. He was pulled off flight status just three days before launch. Measles. He did not sit idly by. After helping develop an advanced spacesuit, he wore it during extravehicular activity, a spacewalk taken during his flight to the moon aboard Apollo 16. Known as a hard driver, the nearly always smiling Mattingly met all his mission goals, even though the flight ended early. Since then, his drive has been put to use overseeing first basic space shuttle development, then organizing the flight tests for Columbia, where he and Hartsfield worked together developing the spaceship's control system. Both men are graduates of Auburn University, the last two-man crew, the last test pilots who hope to prove once and for all the shuttle is ready to go into business. John Getter, News Center 11. Living in the midst of the manned space program has had some strong effects on underprivileged children. The kind of kids who will be in the next generation of astronauts are tomorrow's report on the end of the beginning. Well, this is Andrew. Of the beginning, the last of the shuttle test flights. In tonight's special report, John Getter says it's not just the end of the beginning of the test, but the beginning of the end of open information on space flights. When Columbia flies again, astronauts Ken Mattingly and Hank Hartsfield will show us pictures similar to the views seen the last time, a special study of lightning, a way to make latex even more useful, a project with a big name, the continuous flow electrophoresis experiment with even bigger promise. Its success would probably lead to the placement in orbit of unmanned robot chemical laboratories, which show the promise of producing huge amounts of medicine so pure and so powerful, so comparatively cheap, it could potentially save millions of lives. We will see and hear a lot about that. We will not hear much in detail about the other terribly important tests this time, tests by the Department of Defense. If all goes according to plan, a lot of today's modern military hardware will quickly be outdated, as outdated as these old jets you find on stilts outside the American Legion post. Devices being carried now may well nearly eliminate the need, for instance, for radar to look for enemy missiles and planes. They'd all be seen by satellite. No more sneak attacks. Except by maybe another satellite, unmanned, or station, manned. Well, there's also a device aboard which would let important satellites and shuttles see approaching enemy killer satellites. The Russians have already tested such a satellite. They are also reported years ahead in developing powerful laser and particle beam weapons, literally death and destruction rays. But the Air Force will not confirm this officially. They brought their top PR man to Johnson Space Center to say... Some of the things when they stand alone would not be classified. When they're mated to the uh, shuttle, would be. And I would not care to go beyond that. They will confirm they are working on these projects, but won't officially admit they are flying on this, the first shuttle flight to openly work for the military, in secret. And when the critical tests are finished, they will not talk about results. In the curious game of defense, making people wonder about what works as much as about what does not is a way of life, and now a fact of life in space. John Getter, News Center 11. And on tomorrow's fifth and final report on the end of the beginning, John will take us on the closest thing yet to space, and that's a ride into weightlessness. We hope you'll come along with us. Thanks for joining us now. I hope to see you tonight at 10 o'clock. David Andelman has the story of a launch and the down-to-earth politics behind it.
the nighttime liftoff came on schedule, the huge five-engine rocket hurling the 6.8-ton Soyuz spacecraft into a near-perfect Earth orbit from its launch pad in the Central Asian Cosmodrome of Baikonur. Inside, the cargo, two very relaxed Soviet cosmonauts and a French Air Force colonel, 43-year-old Jean-Luc Chrétien, the first non-American Westerner to travel in space. Throughout the launch preparations, even as the capsule headed into orbit, the three laughed, joked by radio link with reporters on the ground, even waved to the folks back home. Soviet cosmonauts have always had much less control over their spacecraft and much less to do than their American counterparts. And out there, with a Frenchman along, they'll also be dining well. Jugged rabbit a l'Alsacienne, lobster pilaf, and country pâté, all squeezed from tubes. The Franco-Soviet manned launch is the first major project involving a Western cosmonaut since the American-Soviet joint mission seven years ago. That program was abandoned in part for political reasons, partly because American space officials concluded that the Soviets learned far more than the U.S. from such joint projects. David Andelman, CBS News, Bosco. Korea is poised for Sunday's liftoff from the Kennedy Space Center. And in about 15 minutes, we'll be talking with the crew of this final test of the space shuttle. Langley and Henry Hartsfield are due to arrive at Cape Canaveral later this afternoon. Our science correspondent, Bob Bazell, is already there. Bob, good morning. Good morning, Heidi. This fourth flight of the Space Shuttle Columbia is significant for several reasons. This is the last test flight. After this, they will be strictly mission-oriented. And on this flight, the Columbia carries a payload from the Department of Defense. This is the first time in the history of our civilian space program that a craft is carrying out a military function. That's something that the shuttle will be doing a lot of from now on. Although the Pentagon's payload is supposed to be top secret, in fact, it's one of the worst kept secrets in military history. There are two light sensing devices on board. One detects infrared light, the other ultraviolet light. They're only being tested on this flight, but in the future they'll be used for spying at targets on the Earth and for detecting enemy missile firing. Throughout the night here at the Kennedy Space Center, the countdown was in a hold as workmen pumped supercooled helium into the infrared sensing device. The flight here will also mark the first time that NASA has rendered space on one of its craft to a civilian. A professor at Utah State University paid $10,000 to put this canister on board. It contains experiments designed by this group of students, measuring things from the growth of fruit flies in space to how glue sets without gravity. As of now, everything is going smoothly for the launch, which is scheduled for 11 a.m. Sunday morning, Eastern Time. Heidi? Thanks, Bob. Five cosmonauts already in orbit in two separate spacecraft are due to link up later today. The Soyuz spacecraft launched by the Russians from Central Asia yesterday will dock with the Salyut 7 space station, which has been circling the globe for two months. The four Soviets and one Frenchman aboard plan a week of experiments. It's going to be all right. In the morning, partly cloudy skies, a chance of showers in the afternoon, the high temperature about 82, but it should be a fairly nice morning if they don't have to go in the afternoon. So they'll get it off. And Brian is coming to take the shuttle back to be here Monday, so uh, with a little luck, you'll be here. Kabul, C-A-B-O-O-L, Missouri is 100 years old today. Happy birthday. The weather map and the jet stream is all revealed there for your bedazzled eyes. And we're back now at 716. Astronauts Ken Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield will be at the controls Sunday when the Columbia Space Shuttle blasts off on its fourth and final test flight. It will be the first time, however, that it carries a military payload into space for the Pentagon. I talked to the astronauts recently in Houston, and I asked them if there are any special problems in handling a top-secret cargo. No, none that I know of. Uh, anything particular, I guess, uh, that, that you would care to know about that payload, we'd have to ask DOD. Aren't going to talk very much about that, are you? No, sir. We're in our agreement with the uh, DOD. Uh, they are the spokesman for all aspects of the DOD cargo. Some people might say, isn't it a pity that we go to this new frontier of science, adventure, and that we end up filling it with weaponry, with military equipment? It's a shame any time force is involved in resolving disagreements. My role in the Department of Defense as a military officer is to make sure that if and when the force is required, that we're on the winning side. Captain Mattingly, you were up in space 10 years ago on a moon mission. What are you most looking forward to in returning to space? Oh, I think that uh, space flight is a very exciting thing. Uh, 
think one of the kicks that I'm going to have is seeing how much fun Henry has. Because I know how much fun it is. And he, he thinks he knows, but he doesn't know yet just how much fun he's going to have. You have been in the space program since 1966. And now, after all those years, you're finally going to get your chance to go up into space. What are your emotions? I feel uh, a great deal of satisfaction and, and uh, I feel like I'm within reach of achieving something which I've worked for a long, long time. Was there any frustration uh, during all those years that thought, gee, I might not make it into space? Oh, yes, that thought did cross my mind occasionally and I, I wouldn't be totally candid if I didn't say there were some times that things looked pretty bleak. Uh, it's, it, it looked like everything was just a little further away than I really wanted it to be. Let's talk a little bit about you, Tim. Uh, Ken Mattingly, give me a thumbnail sketch of Henry Hartsfield. <laughs> Not fair. Well, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get your chance. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's fair. fair. <laughs> no, I... What can you say? Uh, Hank and I have known each other for, see, I don't know how many years now. He makes doing our job, which is takes a lot of hours out of every day, a lot of fun. Uh, I think we probably had more chuckles during a day, although I, I couldn't tell you what it was about. I uh, couldn't tell you what it was, but Hank's a master of one-liners and puns and, and sees humor in, the, in things. I think that I could come up with several adjectives that, uh, that I could use to describe Ken, one of which is intense. He's one of the most intense individuals I've ever known as far as... Uh, concentrating totally on a task and uh, working it as hard as he can. And uh, that's a good characteristic. It's not present in everybody. And uh, and also he likes good about jokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm using the same jokes. So I want to hear one of your jokes. <laughs> yeah. well, make me laugh. Make him laugh. Well, they have to be spontaneous. I don't know. I just, I just say hear me sometimes with things. Well, well tell, tell the feet. Orville and Wilbur joke which you were telling before. Because that says a little bit about how you guys feel about the spotlight. <laughs> well, it's a... Uh, it's a story I heard. I haven't been able to verify it's true or not, but uh, I read it somewhere that uh, Wilbur, Wilbur and Orville were rather shy. They didn't, they didn't like to make speeches. The Wright brothers. The Wright brothers, yes. And uh, the banquet somewhere that was dragging on, they asked, uh, I forget which one asked, for example, Wilbur to speak, and Wilbur got up and says, uh, Orville always speaks for us, and he sat down. So they called on Orville to, to speak, and he says, Wilbur just made the speech, and he sat down. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably a pretty good joke up on the top of the space shuttle. <laughs> Late at night, it gets even better. <laughs> <laughs> you were scheduled to land on the 4th of July. Yes, sir. Does that have any special meaning for you? Just to me. I, I think it's pretty exciting to fly around the 4th of July. I, I love my country. I believe in it strongly. I've done limited traveling around the world, but... Uh, and observe uh, other countries. And uh, I know our country's not perfect, but it should beat the heck out of whatever second. It's the only place I want to live. You may notice our patch has got red, white, and blue in it, and it's got the four in it, the fourth flight, and it's also the fourth of July. And it all fits together real nice. Gentlemen, best of luck. Thank you. Sir. Safe journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Space Shuttle Columbia. For the latest on the situation, we go live to the Johnson Space Center for a report from Susan Starnes. Susan? Bob, the weather at Cape Kennedy today was much like that around Houston. Clear in the afternoon and then stormy late in the day. At launch pad 39A, countdown has gone smoothly with astronauts and scientists monitoring all shuttle systems without any problems. Then late this afternoon, a thunderstorm pelted Columbia with pea-sized hail. When that storm cleared, around 400 heat shield tiles were discovered to be damaged. NASA officials tonight do not believe the hail damage is very serious. Some of it is to tiles on the rudder. They do not think that the damage is enough to delay Columbia's scheduled launch at 10 o'clock our time tomorrow morning, but they're reserving final judgment on that until a tile expert from the Johnson Space Center, Bob Dolph, comes personally from JSC to Kennedy to inspect those tiles and give a final report. 
Susan Starnes reporting live from the Johnson Space Center. ...were needed. The huge scaffolding structure was rolled back into... What they did was they spackled them, much the same way as you would fix some plaster in your home. In fact, the, the work on that, the tiles was completed two hours early, just after midnight, with no interruption to the countdown. So as of now, everything is still going very smoothly. It looks very good for a launch on time. Tom? Thank you very much, Bob. We'll be talking about the clock, of course, during the course of this next 90 minutes that will be on the air here for the launch of Space Shuttle 4. Let me remind you that there are two times that we are talking about. We're now officially on the clock at T-minus 36 minutes, but that does not mean it's going to launch in 36 minutes because there are two 10-minute holes built into this next hour before the scheduled liftoff at 11 a.m. this morning, Eastern, da uh, Eastern Daylight Time. Standing by in New York now with more news of what's going on in this Shuttle 4, which will be carrying, among other things, a classified military test payload. We'll be talking more about that later in the program. I want to introduce to you now our resident expert on all of this, uh, an astronaut from the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, a man who's looking forward to his own ride in the space transportation system next spring. This is Navy Captain Rick Howe. Rick, nice to have you with us. Thank you. I appreciate NBC letting me come down to see my first launch. It's all right. a lot of fun. So that, isn't that something? As a matter of fact, most of us in this room have seen more than you have. You haven't That's seen any true. of these go off the pad. Right. You can tell he's a military man, by the way, because he'll be wearing the tie during the course of this program. <laughs> Rick, you're going to be uh, going up in a new orbiter, the Challenger, which is uh, still another airplane that NASA is bringing online, so to speak. That's right. That's number two, and we'll be flying the second flight on Challenger in April of next year. Any hesitation in your mind about going? We were talking a lot about going up in a used spacecraft before, and now you get the new one. Well, not at all. As a matter of fact, this is the one that's been used for doing a lot of structural tests out at Palmdale, and uh, we're sure it's in good shape. You'll have another unique aspect on your ride as well. There will be the first woman astronaut going right. along, Sally Ride. Sally Ride. Real professional person. And she'll be operating the arm, will she? And be she'll doing be doing that. Stuff? That's correct. And she'll also be our flight engineer. She'll be sitting in between Bob Crippen and myself for both launch and re-entry, making sure we do the right things. Okay. Well, it's nice to have you with us today, and we were going to talk, we're going to show now our audience a report on the Challenger, which, as I say, is the second of the orbiters to come along, and Meredith Lewis has been taking a look at the construction of it as it uh, comes online. Here's that report. Air Force plant number 42 in Palmdale, California. Beneath the platforms and scaffolding is the newest space shuttle, the Challenger. Challenger will fly next January while the Columbia gets an overhaul. Challenger and Columbia look exactly alike, but there are some differences. Challenger is lighter, stronger, and more roomy than Columbia. It will carry four people and a larger payload. Another difference, the Columbia has a modern ejection seat system to provide the crew with an emergency getaway. But the Challenger will not carry ejection seats for several reasons. Primarily taking the seats out leaves more space, and NASA points out that the Columbia flights have been so safe that it's like not giving parachutes to passengers on a modern jetliner. A satellite will be the only cargo on Challenger's first flight. The satellite will be used by NASA for communications with future space shuttle missions. This same satellite will be shared by commercial users. On Wednesday, while Columbia is still in orbit, the Challenger is scheduled to roll out of the hangar for the piggyback delivery to Cape Kennedy. Meredith Lewis, NBC News, Palmdale, California. So the Challenger is coming onto the line now, and of course this space program, the space shuttle system, is uh, still a very popular success in this country, according to all recent polls. But recently a Congressional Advisory Committee raised some questions about our civilian space program in this country. Two weeks ago, the Congressional Office of Technology released this very thick 391-page report, and the bottom line is that American leadership in non-military space technology is seriously threatened because the government simply has not very well-defined long-range goals. Even the commercial promise of this shuttle has been dimmed somewhat by competition in the world. Launchings will be less frequent than planned originally by NASA, now estimated at 300 flights through 1992 instead of 500 according to the original blueprint, and they will cost more, perhaps twice as much as they were originally estimated to cost. NASA has now contracts put up, uh, to put up 62 domestic and 50 foreign telecommunication satellites, but it is getting stiff competition from something called Ariane Space. Now, that's a commercial space company developed by the 11-nation European Space Agency, but mostly it is controlled by France. We want to show you uh, some of their advertising as well. 
It's been advertising in magazines like this one, Aviation Week and Space Technology. It already has three American companies, General Telephone, Southern Pacific Communications, and Western Union. Ariane Space uses an expendable rocket system. It will charge $28 million for each launch. NASA originally figured it would be easy to beat that figure, uh, that it would uh, share cargo space with several customers. Originally, the NASA price was about $31 million for a full shuttle ride. But inflation probably will push that up to $40 million by 1983, and we're now told as much as $71 million in late 1985. Well, to talk about all of those figures and the future of the space program is Congressman Ronnie Flippo, a Democrat from Alabama, with us now. He's chairman of the House Space Science and Application Subcommittee. Congressman, let me ask you, do you think that we do have enough definition going into this space transportation system? Yes, I think so. Our, our problem, as you mentioned, about not getting enough uh, uh, other types of civilian programs is a matter of money. We're, uh, we're really losing uh, our leadership in communications and remote sensing in a lot of civilian programs. But it's a matter of money. But there's been a fair amount of commercial skepticism about the uh, practicality of this, hasn't there? Well, there, there has been, but uh, I think these demonstrations are proving that that skepticism is uh, poorly placed, that the shuttle is doing a great job, and uh, as we get more routine, uh, we can get the cost down. All right, but the, but the fact is that we're now twice as much as the European space agency. Well, I think you have to say uh, many people feel the uh, Europeans are subsidizing the cost of their operations there, and if that uh, is the truth, uh, then there's no way you can, they can always cut the price if that's the deal. But the shuttle has many unique capabilities, such as the ability to repair in space and retrieve so that future satellites can be designed for more uh, stay time in orbit and um, and repair, make them reusable as well. Uh, one company in New Jersey wants to buy one of these orbiters. It wants to be the owner of a Columbia or a Challenger or whatever and then have NASA as a contractor put it up for it. Is that a good idea? Well, I'm not sure. It's worth investigating. I do think that uh, we have to move the shuttle to the private sector and we have to involve more private sector funding in the space program because we're at a stage now where we need large dollars and we need the the management that comes from the private sector. You, uh, you come from Alabama, which has yes. a fair amount of uh, space-related uh, employment going on down there, so I suspect you don't hear from your constituents very much about uh, the cost of this program. Yes, Alabama is very pr uh, proud to be participating in the uh, program. Uh, the cost of the program is uh, showing great uh, growth in communications, and to the extent that we have a dynamic economy today, it's because of the investments that we made a few years ago in science and technology. But do you think that as we uh, continue to spend more money on, say, military payloads, and as that becomes more visible, that the country in a recession will begin to say, hey, wait a minute, we, you know, this is just not cost effective? I think the people uh, want to use the technology developed by shuttle for national defense purposes if that's necessary. What we don't want to happen, we don't want to squeeze out, squeeze out civilian programs by using money appropriated for civilian purposes for mil primary and military payloads. That's the problem. Uh, I don't think anyone objects to using it, uh, but they, we do object to uh, not being able to go forward with communications and remote sensing and materials processing and those kind of programs that we really need in the private sector and the civilian sector. All right. Thank you very much, Congressman Flippo, for being with us Thank today. Thank you, Tom. Okay, well, of course. Uh, the situation is looking very good here. The weather, uh, we just had a report on that from Hugh Harris, and he says it's looking just fine. Visibility is good, and of course, that's important in case they have to do a, an immediate abort and come back here and land on that three-mile-long runway at the Kennedy Space Center. We're now officially at uh, 24 minutes and 12 seconds uh, and counting very well. There you can see the orbiter on the launch pad with the brown external tank and the two solid rocket boosters. Ten-minute hold, still planned. Things are looking good, and we'll be back with more from the Kennedy Space Center right after this. A.M. Eastern Daylight Time. This morning, uh, they're now at uh, T minus 21 uh, minutes and counting. They've just transferred the computer load from the primary to the backup. Do I have that in the right sequence? That's primary to backup uh, computers, and that is apparently going all right. We've had some troubles with the computers in previous flights, as you well know. There is a 10 minute hold scheduled at uh, 20 minutes, so we'll be in a hold pattern, and then we'll have one more 10 minute hold. So everything continues to go well. Astronaut T.K. Mattingly, as he's known to his colleagues at uh, the Johnson Space Center, Thomas Kenneth Mattingly, and Henry Hartsfield are in the Columbia orbiter, and they're ready for a seven-day flight, 113 orbits. There's other news in the world this morning, of course, today as well. Let's go to Philadelphia. 
Right. At 19 after the hour, the final countdown is continuing for the launch of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Columbia is scheduled to take off in about 40 minutes. You're looking at a live picture now from Cape Canaveral at the Kennedy Space Center and the launch pad of the Columbia. And uh, I was interested in astronomy as a child, and uh, uh, things changed, you know, and I went about doing my own thing. Of course, then it wasn't too uh, encouraging for a little girl to uh, do any of these things, and uh, so, of course, it, it never happened. But I just had this thrill a few minutes ago of meeting um, Sally Ride, who's going to be going up. Uh, Going up with Rick Hawk, right? Right, with Rick. Uh, April 20th, I believe. Six days. Yes. Well, I tell you, I just, I couldn't stop touching her. I was so excited to meet meet someone uh, like that, you know. And, gosh, a woman, finally. I think Fellow Californian at that. Yeah. Well, Texas for me, then California, right. now Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. That's very nice. Well, let me ask you, uh, have you ever been nervous about flying yourself? Yes, I, I used to get, <laughs> yes, I went through that period where I would be nervous to put airmail on a letter. <laughs> You know, and then I and then I got over it because I fly quite a bit now since we live in Hawaii and we uh, I get Cessna lag just from going uh, you know inner island and I'm not frightened of it at all now. In fact, I'm planning on taking flying lessons starting in September when I go back home to Maui. And you honestly think that maybe someday you will get to go up as a passenger? If they will allow that, I want to sign my name. To, yes, if they would let me go up today, I would do it. You go right up there and strap you, in. You bet. I might need a jumpsuit and a helmet or something, but you you guys have that, right? Well, we have a few lying around. I'd do it. Head. Hey, man, any stowaway, I'm ready. I would do it, yes. Okay. Carol Burnett, who went from being interested in the stars to being a very big star herself, here for the launch. And my guess is, Carol, that as much as you're ready for it, it will be even grander than you anticipated because oh, it just blows away everybody's concern. I know. It's a thrill to be here. And God bless everybody. Yeah. Nice to see you again. Thank you, John. Okay. Rick. Everything is going well. We're at the hold period now. We've got a 10-minute hold. That's uh, 20 minutes on the NASA countdown clock. That means that they'll be making some uh, prearranged checks, making sure that everything is in good order. The astronauts are up there going through with a, their pre-flight manual, making sure that all is well in the cockpit, too. You can see it out there on the launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center. That's the big external tank in the background. Now brown, originally white, but they decided not to paint it because they could save money and about 600 pounds at liftoff by leaving it in its natural state. Those two solid rocket boosters uh, on the side there, which get it right off the pad, uh, they're later recovered, although these are still the new ones. They haven't started recycling those yet. We'll be back with more from the Case uh, Kennedy Space Center right after this. Hi, we're back at the Kennedy Space Center. As you can see, we're in a 10-minute hold with the countdown clock now showing 20 minutes and holding. It's a prearranged 10-minute hold as they go through a number of their pre-flight procedures. The Columbia Orbiter with its back to you, so to speak. We'll be talking more about uh, some of the goals of this particular mission. It is the last in the test flight series. This is the fourth now, and it'll become operational this fall in November with uh, STS-5. Uh, the crowds for this launch are not as great as they have been from, for some previous launches. It's, uh, for one thing, it is the fourth, after all, liftoff of a space shuttle, the same one, the Columbia Orbiter. Also, it's pretty warm and pretty humid down here at this time of the year in Florida, although still quite spectacular from a weather point of view. Visibility very good right now. One camper uh, owned by a man, or rather, I am afraid, borrowed by a man from Michigan, a tourist, came down here and had a little trouble. An electrical fire wiped out everything that he had, but he's going to stay around and watch, watch the launch nonetheless. We have Ike Siemens standing by, keeping track of the crowds as they line the beaches and the causeways and the highways of the uh, Cape Canaveral area. Here's Ike. To see a space shuttle launch, they come in tour buses. They come in campers, private cars, a cruise ship, and some, like Lee McRae and his son from Mount Carmel, Illinois, rode a motorcycle almost a thousand miles to get here. Someday my son and maybe his boys, somebody else may, may be living in space. I don't know. So we come down to see what it's all about. Uh, when you're a hardcore space junkie, knowing how to kill time is important. Some claim private viewing spots days in advance. <laughs> music and dancing. There must be music and dancing. Launch time is party time here. And eating, right out there in the open. And not just snacks either, but mom's home cooking on the causeway, in the middle of the night. There's a little something for everybody, too. 
The mosquitoes are bad. Yes, they are. <laughs> mosquitoes have to eat. Launch watchers are awfully tasty this time of the year. By first light, the really serious space watchers were in place and getting ready. Well, most of them were getting ready. As many as a million people are in the area to watch the fourth test flight of the space shuttle. Most know Columbia will orbit the Earth for seven days and will land on the eighth day. Seven-year-old Karen Contraman thinks she knows where. Where's it going to land? On the moon. Where'd you get that information? My daddy told me. What does he do? He works at Kennedy Space Center. And finally, there's this crowd. Hundreds of photographers who will take thousands of pictures that you'll be seeing all day, all night, and maybe forever. Ike Siemens, NBC News, at the Kennedy Space Center. All right, the clock has resumed counting once again. We have emerged from the 10-minute hold with only one minor asterisk, so to speak, a kind of flaw that they're concerned about a little bit, and that is the temperature on a steam vet on some water heaters on board. They don't think that it's a large enough problem to cause any difficulty with the arranged launch time of 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time this morning. You can see the clock is still going. In fact, uh, the commander of this uh, uh, Space Shuttle 4, the Columbia Orbiter, uh, that is uh, astronaut T.K. Mattingly, Thomas Ken Mattingly, as he is known, has been told that they have a go for a launch. Rick Houck is with me now. I gather everything is going along well. They're just a little concerned about some spiking in the temperature. Yeah, I think they saw a temperature go maybe slightly out of limits, and, uh, and uh, they've evaluated that that's not a problem. So I don't anticipate that causing any, any problem. They've just dumped the computer, the primary computer, to do an uh, on-the-ground check to make sure all the ones and zeros inside it are proper. And uh, after they get that checked, they've got to go for the flight computers. OK, well, it does sound very good. The, uh, the orbiter last night took a real hard hit from a hailstorm, by the way, and we talked about that earlier today, but about 400 of the tiles were damaged, and they had to go out there and, much as you like, might patch up your uh, bathroom wall, they spackled them back into place. They might have done a better job than you and I would do, or at least certainly than I would do in those circumstances, but everything looks pretty good, and it took a lot of uh, rainwater as well, because they don't have a garage that they can move this into on short notice, as you might expect. So we'll be watching that uh, temperature on the steam vent, but as of now, it does not seem is that it will turn into a major problem of any kind. There is on board the Columbia Orbiter, Space Shuttle 4, something called DOD-82-1. That's a military payload. It's a testing of some sensors. We'll talk about that, even though it's classified, uh, in just a few moments. We have Bob Bazell standing by outside now, and he's going to give us a review of the early morning activities of these two astronauts, T.K. Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield. Robert? Tom, good morning. The uh, temperature out here is a, has a little glitch in it. I'm getting a wonderful suntan standing around waiting for this uh, space shuttle launch. In fact, that seems to be the most dramatic thing that's going on around here is a lot of people getting suntans. The countdown has been right on schedule ever since it began four days ago, and the astronauts' preparations this morning went just like they were supposed to. Navy Captain Thomas Mattingly, the commander of the fourth shuttle flight, and pilot Henry Hartsfield, a former Navy man, were awakened right on schedule at 6.10 this morning. After breakfast, they put on their spacesuits, assisted by Joe Schmidt in the upper right-hand corner, who was retiring today after helping astronauts get ready since the first manned space flight here in 1961. After that, the traditional greetings from NASA workers, and then the ride out to the launch pad. As they prepared to enter the hatch, the astronauts found a sign on the wall saying, Go War Eagle. The War Eagle is the mascot of Auburn University, alma mater for both Mattingly and Hartsfield. After the two men strapped themselves in, flight controllers had nothing but good news. Good morning, sir. Good morning to you. Uh, I think we have a beautiful morning for you this morning. And it certainly, uh, Tom, it certainly does look like a beautiful morning out here. Uh, the astronauts are now in the, in the capsule talking to the flight controllers. Uh, that temperature problem doesn't seem to be causing any major concern, and it looks like they're going to go off on time at 11 a.m. Tom? All right. Thank you, Robert Bazell. By the way, uh, the service has always interested me in, in, in this kind of a situation. We have Hartsfield, who's a former Air Force colonel. Right. He's and retired. He, and the elder of the two. And Mattingly mm -hmm. comes from what he's, branch? 
He's from the Navy, yeah. and he's still active duty. That's why I, I wanted our Navy captain here to get on the little water. Matter of fact, he's our senior naval officer in the astronaut office now. And you were saying uh, a few moments ago he's one of the hardest workers you've ever seen anywhere. I tell you what, if uh, everyone in this world put in the hours that uh, TK did, we'd have productivity like you couldn't believe. Okay. We'll have more productivity here from the Kennedy Space Center right after this. NBC News coverage of the launch of Space Shuttle 4 will continue in a moment. Well, that's something that he can use to uh, 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 that's my terminology. It's called a super And in case the crew wants to snack a little on the launch pad, there's even a bottle of water and a sandwich neatly tucked away in a pants pocket. At least things are neatly tucked away when they go out, but not when the astronauts come back. As the shuttle goes into regular commercial operation, future crews will suit up on their own. So for Joe Schmidt, this is a last hurrah. Well, there is uh, Columbia nesting on the pad there, viewed from our cameras about a few miles away, and you see the crowds already gathered there in the VIP uh, viewing area, some uh, military brass. Gene, uh, I'd like to ask you, why will it uh, not be necessary for the astronauts to wear these uh, flight suits the next time when they go up? Well, Frank, uh, going out of the, uh, the test or experimental and engineering test phase as we are with the completion of uh, the fourth flight, we go in, uh, in the operational phase. We take a lot of bulky hardware and equipment off that uh, measures the performance of the spacecraft. We assume now after this flight that we'll know how it's going to perform. We can put more payload on, and of course, part of that payload is people. We're going to put two more people on and, uh, and actually take the ejection seats out. Uh, it wouldn't quite be fair to have uh, availability for two men to eject and not four. Uh, along with that, of course, goes our confidence in the spacecraft and uh, the confidence in the spacecraft to be able to hold uh, the, the Earth-like atmosphere that it takes for survival in space. Thank you, Gene. I think the uh, key word there is confidence in uh, the way the program is moving along. Well, we're about three minutes or so away from the uh, planned 10-minute hold, so uh, we're going to pause for just a moment now. We'll have more on the coverage of Space Shuttle Columbia in a moment from the Kennedy Space Center, where all continues to go satisfactorily, right on schedule for the launch of Space Shuttle 4 at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time this morning. With me is a member of the Astronaut Corps, Navy Captain Rick Hauck, who will be going up in April of 1983 in the seventh flight of the Space Shuttle series, and he'll be going up in the new one, the Challenger. But we want to talk just for a moment here about what will be going on during this test flight. We'll be talking more about what's inside the payload uh, later on. But they're going to be doing some more thermal testing this time, right? That's right. The uh, intent is to expose the uh, space shuttle to the most severe environment, temperature-wise, uh, that they can early in the program, because we've got a lot of sensors that are around inside. And once we're uh, happy with that, then we're happy for the rest of the mission. All right. We're going to show you NBC's special effects department here at the Kennedy Space Center at great expense. They I have arranged see. for a sun to come in right on cue. Okay. Cue the sun. That's there it jolly, is. There it is. How about that? And what we're going to do is show you the relationship of the uh, Columbia orbiter to the sun. They're going to fly tail the sun for what? The longest six period. hours. Mm -hmm. yeah, and what they, they want to make sure that, that the payload bay doors can still close. And That's the, right, because you get differential heating across from the tail to the front, and there may be some uh, expansion or warpage and so on. So uh, that's about as severe an environment as they have. And then they have what they call the barbecue mode. They put it on a, yeah. a, a rotisserie. And, and that just sort of rotates like this. And well, the There's the dumps the payload out, there you go, <laughs> and uh, gives it a uh, even heating all around. Sorry. We expect, by the way, that the payload will be bolted in to the actual Columbia Orbiter, <laughs> even if it isn't here. If we could have some super glue, please. That's if I don't push the wrong switch. <laughs> That's right. Captain Hauck will have his hands on the controls next year. We'll all be watching him very carefully. <laughs> Let's go to Houston, where Roy Neal is standing by, and he has a uh, more detailed report now on some of the other goals of this particular mission. Roy? Flight controllers here in Houston say this is the last shuttle flight in which the spaceship is more important than the cargo. So they list priorities, goals, if you will, like this. The Columbia will be checked out thoroughly. One end will be baked and the other frozen by turning it tail to the sun for several days. When it comes in for a landing, automatic systems will do most of the work, and NASA hopes to find a crosswind blowing across the desert at Edwards Air Force Base. There will be a prototype space factory in the cabin, which the astronauts hope will separate blood chemicals hundreds of times better in weightless space. And a getaway special in a canister. Nine experiments from students at Utah State University, paid for and donated by a local businessman. There's also a military cargo, 
Defense Department Experiment 82-1 in the payload bay, but it's classified. Mattingly and Hartsfield have strict orders not to show it on television or talk about it. With me here in Houston this morning is another of the astronauts, Steve Nagel. Uh, Steve's been following the countdown this morning, and Steve, a moment ago I was mentioning priorities of payload versus spaceship. Can you elaborate just a tad on that? Yes, I can, Roy. In the first four missions, the priority is in the testing of the orbiter itself, and the payloads are secondary, riding along in more or less a piggyback fashion. And after this fourth flight, then we will declare the shuttle to be operational, in which the payloads will then have priority, even though some testing of the orbiter will continue. If something even here at the last minute were to go wrong with one of those payload items aboard the spacecraft, as they just did with Tom Brokaw when he dumped the spacecraft, <laughs> if something were to go wrong, though, would they hold up the launch? Uh, my assumption is that they would not. They would continue with the mission, the priorities being the testing of the space shuttle and the orbiter. You were a capsule communicator talking from mission control to the spacecraft on the last flight. Uh, what would you be looking for right now if you were in mission control? Well, I was uh, an entry Capcom, so we did a monitoring shift, all night shift pre-launch, then handed over to the ascent team. But right now, the ascent uh, Capcom and the ascent team are monitoring the systems very closely and ready for that point where they take over control of the mission right after tower clear. And keeping an ear and an eye on that small temperature spike. You bet. Well, we'll keep an eye on things here, Tom, as you are there at the Cape, sun and all. All right, thanks very much, Roy Neal. We are now in the scheduled 10-minute hold with the countdown clock holding at 9 minutes, still scheduled to lift off at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time this morning. It does continue right on schedule. During the course of this flight, we'll be talking a lot about the military payload. This one is called DOD 82-1, and although the military uh, rather belatedly uh, classified it top secret so they couldn't discuss it at all, there had been so much congressional testimony about it and discussion of it in technical magazines that we all know that it's uh, something to do with an infrared radiance instrumentation of some of the packages on board because later on they'll want to have some military satellites and so on that can pick up weapons as they move across uh, the planet Earth. So this one is a Cirrus, is the official nickname of it. It's a Cyrogenic Infrared Radiance Instrument. But as I say, the Department of Defense can't talk about that. One third of the 40 flights uh, until 1985 will be carrying military packages of one kind or another. And then uh, later on in 1984, the military will launch its own space shuttle transportation systems from Vandenberg out in California. Uh, Dick Valeriani has been looking into the whole military aspect of this and some of the controversy that it has generated for the space program. Here is his report. Recent congressional hearings focus on a growing concern about the space shuttle. Concern that a program funded almost entirely through the civilian budget of NASA may be overwhelmed by military projects. There's general agreement that Pentagon support was instrumental in getting the shuttle off the ground. But critics of the military's growing role were not reassured by a statement made this week by the Air Force Chief of Staff, General Lou Allen. We already depend very, very heavily on space systems and their capabilities for a number of aspects of, of warfare, and including those aspects preceding warfare, such as warning. Uh, and that, I can see no prospect but that that will increase. It's likely the controversy will increase as well as indicated by Congressman Harold Hollenbeck, the ranking Republican on the House subcommittee which oversees the space program. The question of the decade may be then whether we use the shuttle for peace or for war. Now that the shuttle works, the military has climbed aboard the bandwagon. The gauntlet is down, and the battle will be to save the civilian agency that brought us to the moon and beyond. I promise you that there are fights ahead, and unless we are vigilant, the civilian space program could be swallowed up in the giant whale called the Pentagon. A man who has been to the moon and who is now in the Senate sees a different battle shaping up, a battle to make the Pentagon at least pay its own way. Uh, if you uh, just perform an objective analysis using the numbers provided by NASA and agreed to by the Department of Defense, you find that over the next uh, several years, the NASA budget will literally subsidize defense launches. Now, a little bit of subsidy is probably okay in order to even out the yearly fluctuations in the prices, knowing that that subsidy will be recovered uh, in later years. But the degree to which the, def the NASA budget subsidizes the defense budget is, is extreme. So your basic point is that the Department of Defense is not paying its fair share and should. There is no commitment on the part of the military at this point to pay their fair share. Lift off. 
and mission and says that we will see them in California on the our country's 206th anniversary. Center Director Dick Smith wished them a good trip and said Godspeed and a War Eagle. The War Eagle being the uh, battle cry of the Auburn University teams of which both uh, of our uh, astronauts on this morning's flight are alumnus as well as Center Director Dick Smith. Coming out of our built-in hold, T minus nine minutes and counting. The launch events are now being controlled by the ground launch sequencer from now up to T minus 25 seconds when they switch to the onboard redundant set launch sequencer. Of these two hours have gone into space together. Part of the launch processing system and operates by relaying commands to the orbiter's onboard computers which then report back to the launch processing system that the commands have been executed. The primary job of the computers is to check that all of the launch commit criteria, such as propellant loads, temperatures, pressures, and other measurements are proper. The launch and recovery director has ordered the chase planes to take off. T minus 8 minutes, 15 seconds, and counting. DLG, OTC. Go ahead. Set your AC bus sensors to monitor. A number of events will happen during this final eight minutes of the countdown. At T minus seven minutes, the orbiter access arm, which has remained in place, will be retracted. And the astronauts asked to close their visors and verify their seats in the launch position. At T minus six minutes, they will perform the APU or auxiliary power unit pre-start. At five minutes, there will be a go for APU start. The countdown at T minus seven minutes, 20 seconds and counting. Everything continuing to go smoothly towards an on-time liftoff at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time this morning. The liquid oxygen fill and drain valve in the external tank has been closed and topping of the tank completed. The crew access arm will be retracted just seconds from now and has started to move. This is the walkway used by the crew to walk from the service structure on the pad to the orbiter. If an emergency occurs, it can be replaced within 15 seconds. The crew has been advised to lower their helmet visors and verify that their seats are in launch position. T minus six minutes, 35 seconds, and counting. At the six minute point, the crew will perform the auxiliary power unit pre start, which consists of positioning a number of switches and verifying that they are in the proper position then throwing the three propellant isolation valve switches, which allows the hydrazine fuel to start flowing from the tanks toward the APUs. Coming up on the six minute point. T-minus six minutes. T-minus six minutes and counting. The pilot Henry Hutchfield has been asked to perform the APU pre-start. T minus five minutes, 30 seconds, and counting. The development flight instrumentation recorders are on. The DFI provides measurements on temperatures, pressures, and physical stresses in the orbiter. The recorders store this information for playback after landing. Coming up on the five minute point, 12 seconds away, the orbiter flight recorders are on. Five Coming up on T minus five. T finds five minutes and counting. And we have a goal for APU start. T minus four minutes, 50 seconds and counting. APU start is complete. The APUs provide hydraulic power to move the aerospace, aerosurfaces and main engines for steering. 
T minus four minutes, 30 seconds and counting. We're listening to Hugh Harris, the uh, voice for mission control, speaking from the Kennedy Center. Safety destruct devices have been armed. This is done with a motor-driven switch called a Space 7 arm device. They're in the process of starting our auxiliary power units, minutes, and of course that's a and familiar term uh, to us because we've had trouble with uh, with those units and before. Four minutes yes. and 30 seconds well, not very far away. I just want to remind you before we get uh, going here that uh, this week with David Brinkley will immediately follow our broadcast at 11.30 Eastern Time. And the uh, topic of discussion will be the changeover in the control at the Department of State, the resignation of Secretary of State Haig and the accession of uh, George Shultz. At which time the solid rocket ignition sequence starts, culminating with ignition and liftoff at T-0. Frank, I don't know exactly how many people were here, but uh, I've never seen so many cars on an the Causeway. Uh, they were about 12 abreast, stretching for uh, six to eight miles. It was just incredible. Sure, I can understand that, Gene. <laughs> and the young people are just going through. Of course, they're out of school, but they've been here for two or three days, and... Uh, and uh, this launch in Disney World, of course, is going to be the high points in their uh, in their lives for a long time. Well, I'll bet there are a lot of repeaters, too. People who have been down there and seen it once want to come back and see it again. Well, there's a few of us grown-ups here who get a little excited about it, too. <laughs> T-minus three minutes, five seconds, and counting. We can be looking for the big uh, cap on the uh, on the uh, tank, as we see it there, on the uh, liquid hydrogen and oxygen tank to, be, uh, to move back here shortly. They keep that on there till almost the very end in order to prevent the accumulation of any gases, I guess. That's right. They like to keep replenishing the liquid hydrogen and oxygen. Of course, it's so cold that it, 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 they have to uh, keep, it keeps evaporating and they have to keep replenishing it. T minus two minutes, 40 seconds and counting. This will be the second launch for Ken Mattingly. He went up 10 years ago in April of 1972, but it'll be the first seconds. ride into space for Hank Hartsfield. Ground supply of oxygen and, and hydrogen two minutes away. And the there goes that big uh, cover on the uh, on the tip of the uh, external tank being removed now. The spacecraft is on its own internal uh, electrical power, so she's pretty well self-contained. The main engines have been moved to start position. The astronauts have cleared the caution and memory warnings uh, in their onboard computers and verified there are no unexpected errors. T minus two minutes and counting. The astronauts are configuring the auxiliary power units for liftoff. NASA's going to be bursting with pride if this goes off just on the appointed second. Light pressurization underway. Frank has said it before, and this may be the fourth launch, but it's uh, it's always the first time, certainly for the guys on board and uh, for most of the rest of us. Start at T minus one minute. There they are, and their analysis of each other was uh, was very good. They're both extremely capable. They're they're not extremely outgoing, however, but they sure know how to get the job done. Columbia is really beginning to look at home. Twenty seconds and counting. The liquid hydrogen tank is at flight pressure. Coming up on the one minute point in our countdown. Coming up on T-minus one minute. T-minus one minute and counting. The firing system for the sound suppression water system on the pad is armed. Frank, my heart rate just went in the launch phase. Yeah. It's going to be a tremendous pot of smoke. T-minus 45 hits. seconds. We're 14 seconds away from switching command of the countdown from the ground computers to the onboard and computers. There's little or no point, point is it, to get past this 30-second mark. T-minus 35 seconds. The Gox vent arm is fully retracted, and we're switching control of the countdown to the onboard computers. T-minus 25 seconds. The SRB hydraulic power units have started. T-minus 20 seconds and counting. Little or no wind, we can expect lots of smoke. T-minus 15. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Little baby. We have made it. Four, three, two, one, and we have solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle on its fourth mission, and we have cleared the tower.
six seconds, roll maneuver completed. 30 seconds, one nautical mile in altitude, throttle it just down to 65% now, slow down. 36 seconds, spot board status looks good, mission control. 42 seconds, Columbia now three nautical miles in altitude. 46 seconds, coming up on trade, a maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. Columbia now, four nautical miles altitude. Fifty-six seconds, pass through max Q, still looking good. Throttling in. Giving a go at throttle up. Mark one minute, ten seconds. Columbia now, seven nautical miles in altitude, four nautical miles down range. The people here in the case can still see it, right? can still see it, you can One minute. feel it. 20 seconds, Columbia now 9 nautical miles to altitude, 6 nautical miles to range. It's shattering the floor here in the firing room. One minute, 30 like seconds, Columbia now 12 wave. nautical miles to altitude, 9 nautical miles to range. Shock waves Velocity from the reading, rocket going off, physically struck and shook the windows. Next critical point is the firing out of the, uh, the applause here was unbelievable. She's moving. Columbia, Houston, negative C. We're going to get the SRB separation, sir. Just in about 10, 12 seconds. 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 Columbia now 21 nautical miles in altitude to 21 nautical miles down range. Two minutes, three seconds. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Five seconds. This is critical. And there they go. And they drop off. Two minutes, 14 the seconds. Confirm solid rocket booster separation. Now she's on her, uh, her own engine. 20 seconds on board guidance is converging in program. Columbia is now straight for a precise winter in space. So I'll keep going with the uh, external tank until 8 minutes and 50 seconds into the launch. 2 minutes and 35 seconds. Columbia now 33 nautical miles in altitude. That's really carrying the mail. 2 minutes 43 seconds. The calls will be light due to a depressed trajectory. That flame you see now is from liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. We'll That's the main engine burn. Two engine towel capability. Magnificent cameras to be able to capture this at this distance too. Columbia Houston, you have two engine towel capability. Roger, two engine towel. Three minutes, 12 seconds. That call up by Capcom Dave Gregg says that Columbia now has landing capability at the car airport should one engine go out. Three minutes, 20 seconds. Columbia now 44 nautical miles in altitude, 83 nautical miles down range. A return status check and mission control by Flight Director Tom Holloway. They're beyond the point of returning now to the Cape. If anything did happen, they would uh, go on to the car. Seconds. That's Maddie right. They have, uh, go if one continue. engine failed, and of course there's no indication of that, obviously, they could Three land at the car, which is on the other side of the, or on the uh, western side of Africa. We're going to see once again the uh, replay now of the launch. There was no wind, so we got perhaps the clearest view, Frank, uh, because the smoke stayed to the side, and we could see the Columbia lift off right in between that tremendous double plume. There it goes again. By its own, by its own tail of, of smoke and flame. That's what always strikes me, Gene. That wall of flame that lifts it right up. Look at it; it reaches almost to the pad. You can see almost every movement of it as it yeah. begins to, to move away from the pad, uh, and it begins its roll program. And, and we felt here, perhaps greater than any other launch, the the, uh, the sound and the pressure effects. It just, the booth just literally shook. It reminded me of the days of Apollo. <laughs> It's a pretty rocky ride, too, isn't it, uh, in the early stages? Well, it's, 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 it's here we go again. We have 10, shot. 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine ignition. 4, 3, 2, 1. It's disappeared. And we have liftoff. 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 This was the side view. Of course, we had the front on view. Now you can see it roll here as it rolls to the right. And it starts pitching out over the Atlantic as it uh, gains Houston, altitude and speed. It rolls almost immediately, Gene, doesn't it? Almost. As soon as, as, seconds, as soon as it clears the pad, Frank, it starts that roll program uh, to uh, almost a full 90 degrees, I believe, or maybe more than that. But it is very rough. It's very noisy for the crew. Uh, it, 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 it's a combination of vibration and noise.
with the right wisdom behind this vehicle, that car can be harnessed for almost anything they want. They proceed word that they have they have enough power now to go on into orbit. They do now. They're coming up yeah. on six minutes. takes them higher first and now it's beginning to gain speed so rapidly Six you can hardly keep 40 up with it. seconds trajectory plots and mission uh, control still on target this is a live shot from uh, one of the chase planes you can still Six see minutes, the 48 seconds uh, columbia now 57 nautical miles altitude uh, 412 nautical miles the range, distance is a chase plane in a hurry we used to think 40,000 feet was high but not anymore <laughs> see that speed increase now they're really on their back uh, still pointed upward a little bit but as they're headed across the atlantic uh, and the speed is increasing almost by uh, by increments of the speed of sound Standing by for single engine press to Miko. You are single engine press to Miko. Gene, how soon will they actually see the coast of Africa? At this point in time, it should be coming over the horizon just about now, uh, Frank. And of course, they're on their back and they should have a beautiful view. They should see the coast right now. 7 minutes 25 seconds, Columbia now 56 nautical miles in altitude, 515 nautical miles down range. Velocity now reading 19,900 feet per second. Here, here, Frank, what they do is, they, of course, to, to conserve the most energy, they try and gain altitude Seven first, and then they actually sort of pitch down just a little bit uh, to gain a little bit more speed as they get enough speed to, to, uh, to stay in orbit, and then, of course, it pulses up to get the right altitude. And in about a minute now, they will uh, lose the uh, external tank. The, uh, the main engine should shut down and put them uh, not in orbit, but in a position to get in orbit when they fire their smaller onboard engines uh, shortly thereafter shut down. That's the configuration of it right now. The two solid rocket boosters have long since gone, plunged into the Atlantic, and they'll be recovered. But the big uh, ET, the external tank, will, of course, uh, Of course, we're looking for those engines to shut down here in about uh, 15 seconds. 20 seconds. This looks good, mission control. They will actually shut down and they will get rid of the Eight tank, the only seconds, expendable part of the entire spacecraft. Waiting for confirmation. Eight minutes, 40 seconds, confirm shutdown. Uh, yeah. Columbia returned to space for the fourth time, uh, not yet returned to orbit. Returned Standing by now for external tank separation. To keep them in orbit, they must add a little bit more energy to the spacecraft uh, in terms of velocity, and then they will certainly be in orbit for, Confirm again, another seven days. Separation. Uh, Columbia now moving below and beyond the external tank. Go, no, go, status check and mission control by Flight Director Tom Hol Holloway for the first Ohms burn and shutting down the auxiliary power unit. Frank, they can't help but see the coast of Africa on the Earth's horizon, but believe me, uh, it, it's just sort of a stealing glimpse because they're pretty busy at this point in time ready for this uh and now they're all alone too they don't have any uh, of the appendages along with it the solid rocket boosters have gone the big Nine external tank seconds. is gone columbia given a go for the first ohms burn uh, columbia will now be maneuvering to uh, ohms one burn attitude columbia, columbia, is, evap, duck heater messages can be ignored. columbia is now the way we see it uh, when she comes home she's yes. up there in the same configuration she lands in using the uh, two six thousand pound thrust columbia engines houston and the uh, apu thermal can be ignored also Holmes 1 will be posi grade moving Columbia forward and higher on her flight path. Ten minutes, mission elapsed time, about uh, a minute and a half away from uh, loss of signal. Now they are in space, Frank, but they're not in orbit because the low point is too close. It's within the Earth's atmosphere, and that's why they have to uh, do this Ohm's burn and this onboard maneuvering system burn to add a little bit more energy to bring up the low point of the orbit. The uh, references to the Ohm's uh, burn really uh, 
does not suggest that they have the kind of power that would enable them to uh, to really fly. Columbia uh, now in uh, proper attitude for the first Holmes burn. You know, they, they can fly, but they, it's simply for maneuvering purposes in space. And also, of Top course, for the re-entry. reports ignition on both Holmes' engine. Looks good. Now, this is very critical because, as they say, they're racing their orbit so that they can stay in space. And after they make this first Holmes burn, which is about a minute and a half in duration, they will have added enough energy to be in 150 statute mile by 39 statute mile orbit. They have to make then an essential second Ohm's maneuver to circularize at 150 miles. However, one of the great advantages of being here in Houston instead of being at the Cape is that I get to sit with a current astronaut. Uh, joining us for our coverage of the space shuttle of STS-4 is Dr. Judy Resnick. Judy is one of the newer astronauts. She is a mission specialist, her specialty being electrical engineering, but who knows what she'll do when she gets in orbit. Judy, welcome. It's nice to have you. Thank you. Um, one of the things we were talking about before is once these guys get up there and on orbit, they've got a very strange working day. It's a little bit different from what it's been in the past. Well, today they're going to take it easy. Uh, the only strange part about it is when they go to sleep and when they get up. They will get about eight hours of sleep every night, but that will start tonight, for example, at 7.30 our time. Uh, having them get up about 3 to 30 in the morning. And that changes, that changes all week until it's earlier and earlier, right? We gradually uh, move the wake-up time a little bit earlier so that on the landing day they have enough time to get up and get all the things done that they need to do before they deorbit to land at Edwards at uh, 9 o'clock uh, Pacific time. So those of us who are following it on mission control, we are if we're on astronaut time, we're getting up at uh, 12, 1, 2, 3 in the morning and, and going to bed around dinner time. <laughs> That's right. We're more tired than they are. <laughs> Uh, the landing also, if they don't get their crosswind, it will be the first concrete runway landing. Is that correct? Uh, at the present time, that is the plan. While they're on orbit, we were talking before, one of the things you have studied has been the ARM, the remote manipulator system. Um, what are they going to be doing different with the ARM this time when they're up there? Well, uh, once again, we're going to be picking up a small uh, instrumentation package that will measure uh, the contamination around the orbiter, and this package is housed towards the back part of the orbiter. Uh, we are not going to actually let go of the monitor. We're just going to move it around in a pre-programmed sequence to measure uh, the atmosphere that the orbiter puts out as it moves through the orbit. Uh, on later flights, the remote manipulator arm will be used to take large satellites, for example, out of the cargo bay and put them into orbit. Uh, the, the orbiter will act much like a bus at that time, and, and the satellite will be uh, actually getting off at its bus stop, so to speak. We get to the right place and the right time, and, and we'll pick it up with the arm, and we'll uh, put it where we want to, let go, and then back the orbiter away and leave it there. That's, that's really the kind of routine use of the space shuttle that we've been talking about all along, at least that NASA has. Judy, thank you. We will be coming back for lots more conversations with you. And uh, Frank, I believe we're coming up with the first acquisition of signal from the astronauts as they approach orbit. Yes, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Dr. Resnick. Yes, it'll be in about uh, three minutes, I believe, that we'll uh, begin to hear, uh, have contact once again, voice contact between uh, Mission Control in Houston and the astronauts who are at this point over the coast of Africa. We ought to tell you a little bit about them. One interesting fact about Ken Mattingly, who is the commander, uh, he uh, has been an astronaut before, has been for some time, but he's been in space, too. He was uh, the command module pilot of Apollo 16, and one very interesting fact about him is that he was supposed to go on Apollo 13, but only 72 hours before the launch of Apollo 13, he had to be taken off because he had been exposed to German measles. And if you remember, Apollo 13 was the mission that ran into difficulty. And uh, those famous words uttered, Houston, we have a problem that kept the whole world on edge for several days before they finally came back. The other uh, member of the crew, of course, is Henry Hartsfield, Jr. He is a civilian. He's 48 years old. He's been an astronaut since 1969 waiting for this opportunity to fly into space. Free mission. Today, the orbiter Columbia went through some unexpected pitch and roll motions and then straightened itself out. And as Roy Neal reports tonight, the astronauts seem to be having some trouble with their secret military cargo. And now you can take it off and OEX power off and... Uh, Ken Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield looked like a couple of airline pilots in this tape recording they sent back this afternoon. They also showed live pictures of a prototype space factory for processing chemicals. It's working. The astronauts did not show or talk much about the secret Air Force cargo they're carrying, but they seem to be having some problems when they talk cryptically to Air Force mission control. Columbia, this is Sunnyvale. How do you read? Fine, clear. 
we would uh, like you to go to panel L11 and watch the cover and its open LED. This is Sunnyvale, the Air Force Mission Control Center in California, the one the public never hears about, although it's controlled all military space flights for nearly 20 years. And the secret payload aboard the Columbia is not that much of a secret. This Air Force drawing shows a unit called Cirrus, a super cold infrared device with a telescope. It's mounted in the cargo hold, back near the cabin, so you will not see this kind of shot on this flight. The device has been described publicly in Congress. It'll scan the horizon, and in the future should be able to detect the heat of rocket engines. It's secret now only because it's on the Columbia, and military officials won't talk about it. Tomorrow, the astronauts will continue their experiments, military and civilian. And they'll televise the space around the Columbia, looking for contamination that might have been thrown off by the spacecraft. Roy Neal, NBC News in Houston. From space were sent back today, and the astronauts seem to be having a little bit of trouble with that secret military payload. I'm the news reporter Sylvan Rodriguez, who's been monitoring the flight, and he's at the Johnson Space Center now. Sylvan? Dave, here on the second day, we're getting a good idea of what kind of men the astronauts are, astronauts Mattingly and Hartsfield. We do know that they are workers, very hard workers, the kind of workers that would rather stick to a very tight schedule and give up sleep. Routine chores like activating experiments kept them busy all day today, but they did take some time out for a little video work. Here's the first picture sent from space today. I've lost my train of thought on what was on that film, but what we were trying to put together was a picture that shows you Holmes 3. Well, actually, these are not very exciting pictures. They are the first picture sent by the Shuttle 4 crew, and they do show the astronauts working, and they also show here the electrophoresis experiment concerning isolating proteins in an electrical field. There are no pictures of the payload bay area. In previous missions, those kinds of pictures have been the most exciting to date. But there are no pictures of the payload bay area because of something called DOD 82-1. That's that military experiment. And the Air Force had hoped for very little communications concerning that. But because of problems, there has been communications. And the astronauts had to talk on the radio about the problem. Let's listen now. Come on, Mr. Sunny. How do you read? Over. Hey, you're very weak, so speak slowly, sir. At 061730, your LED on. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, well, it doesn't sound like it makes very much sense, and it really doesn't unless you have one of the DOD 82-1 manuals in front of you. Mattingly followed those troubleshooting instructions to the letter. Later, he said he did the job, but, quote, he had no joy doing in what he was supposed to be doing. It is believed that that secret military package has been causing the astronauts a whole lot more work than military planners had counted on in the first place. Dave? And as it orbits, and some of the television pictures beamed back by the crew were a little jumpy too. But the mission's biggest knock is the very expensive loss of both booster rockets, boosters that are supposed to be reusable. As Morton Dean reports, NASA actually has a good idea where the boosters are. They are literally at the bottom of the sea. And we have solid motor ignition and liftoff. As the shuttle roared towards space yesterday, it left behind a major mystery, a $56 million mystery, the case of the sunken rocket boosters. The boosters do just that, help boost the shuttle during the first two minutes of flight. Then the two boosters are jettisoned and parachute into a predetermined target area in the Atlantic. The plan worked on the first three shuttle flights, and the reusable boosters were recovered. Yesterday, the boosters sank and are now some 3,000 feet below the surface. NASA told CBS News today that the replacement cost for each booster is $28 million. The idea was to retrieve them, have the various manufacturers refurbish component parts, and fly the boosters again. Parts of the sunken boosters were to have been on the 8th and 11th shuttle missions. One of the ships that had been tracking the boosters' descent over the Atlantic returned to port today with data that might help solve the mystery of what went wrong. Speculation centers on some sort of parachute malfunction. The manufacturer of the five parachutes used on each rocket booster says the chutes themselves aren't to blame. I don't believe it had anything to do with the chutes. It, it may have, it may have had something to do with the system, but I, I wouldn't speculate on an answer on it. 
the law strikes an expensive blow at one of the major arguments for building the shuttle, that the reusability of the space transportation system would save money. NASA told CBS News that it's likely the taxpayers would put the bill even if one of the contractors is at fault. The irony here is that for the very first time, there were some used booster parts on a shuttle mission. Parachutes from the first shuttle flight. Morton Dean, CBS News, Johnson Space Center, Houston. Quickly on where things stand. Now, the getaway special, that was that group of nine experiments carried in what amounts to a 55-gallon drum in the back of the uh, space shuttle, uh, full of nine experiments done by Utah State University students. It has, uh, it has been flushed, essentially. It is not going to work in this uh, uh, flight. They're still trying to figure out what went wrong, and they'll still try to get it started. But at this point, it needed five and a half days to be successful. They don't have five and a half days left in space. Air sickness, that was a problem the last time around. Um, at this point, neither man has had any severe problems. Hank Hartsfield came up with a headache yesterday, which is one uh, symptom of, hair, of air sickness or space sickness in this regard. They gave him uh, a little scopolamine, that's uh, it's a motion sickness pill, and uh, it apparently has gone away. Everything has been fine. Well, let's see where they are right now. I'm going to push up, pardon me, I'll push a button over here on our thing. Right there you see the, uh, the map inside Mission Control. We can see that the crew is out over the Pacific Ocean headed down towards the pass over South America. They are just about over Hawaii. And you notice the screen, for those of you watching in color, the screen normally blue, this time it's green. That's because, or it's, this time it's red, that's because they have somebody in without a top secret clearance. A lot of security this time, Amanda. We'll see you at 10. Okay, John, thank you very much. I wanted to ask you real quickly, why is it so important that they burn the rain off? Well, it's, it's kind of a long explanation, Amanda, but essentially if it's left under there, when they come back through, they're afraid it could turn to steam real quickly and cause some of the uh, tiles to pop off. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And see you tonight at 10 o'clock. Well, Dave, not only have they sent back spectacular views of the planet Earth, they have solved an old problem and confronted a new one. However, the word at the halfway point in the mission is not to worry. Lynn Scher reports from Mission Control in Houston. Uh, it's affirmative, Kiki. We can see the bow. This is the problem. That slight bowing or distortion in the left-hand payload bay door. The distortion was located uh, here along the rear of the door, and it became evident when an attempt to latch the door at the back failed. Shuttle Commander T.K. Mattingly described his reaction when he noticed it. We had just, we had just looked at each other and said, uh-oh. It's similar to a problem STS-3 had when its doors wouldn't latch after a long period away from the sun. STS-4 has also been orbiting with its doors in the frigid temperatures of space. After reopening the door late this afternoon, Mattingly said the warp seemed to have disappeared. And NASA engineers told ABC News they expect the problem to be solved completely as the doors get warmed by the sun later tonight. Earlier, Mattingly, who's been called a very regimented man, was completely laid back in zero gravity sharing a bag of weightless peanuts with his pilot, oh, Henry Hartsfield. Okay, Mattingly first aimed down. his camera out the window, pointing the out right the Kennedy the Space Center in Florida and the concrete yes, runway where the shuttle will land in the future. Sight, yes, sir, that's a, that's a familiar sight. Uh, it just stands out like it was painted with a big arrow from here. He also showed tape of the nose of the orbiter, firing one of the jets in a test. Inside, pilot Hartsfield floated enthusiastically to the freezer where they'd stored the ice cream. Then he held the camera while Mattingly demonstrated some new suction cup shoes he's trying out. Mattingly also showed off the toolkit he'd used to repair the switch for the getaway special canister. You gotta say one thing. Yay! For Gil Moore, who'd bought the canister and some of the student experimenters, their gratitude was relayed in a message back to the spacecraft. So their words here, it was one small switch for NASA and a giant turn on for them. But while that problem is solved, the situation with the payload bay door won't be known until tomorrow, when they try to latch it again after the sun's had a chance to warm the mechanism. Without its doors locked, Columbia cannot return to Earth. Lynchur, ABC News. Here today, NASA hopes to have both spacecraft at the landing site, Edwards Air Force Base, on Sunday, the day Columbia is scheduled to return to Earth. Challenger, of course, will be towed to Edwards. The last of the test flights for the space shuttle continues to go well, although today there was a problem with one of the big payload bay doors. Handles with a suction cup, modeled by Mattingly. Now down on the mid-deck, the astronaut's kitchen. This is a food warmer, if you hadn't guessed. It's really not our traveling kit. And finally, Ken Mattingly showed Dave Briggs in Mission Control how easy it is to throw a curve in space. 
Uh, it's affirmative. What do you suppose that is? Roger, we're assuming it's air flow in a cabin. Oh, you get an A. Roy Neal, NBC News at the Johnson Space Center. And in California today, the second shuttle orbiter, the Challenger, was rolled out. Well, a Marine band played the theme from Star Wars, Rockwell International turned over the space plane to NASA. The new orbiter is supposed to be able to make 100 missions without a major overhaul, and it weighs 2,000 pounds less than Columbia, the original orbiter now in space. The Challenger is scheduled for its first flight in January 1983. It will be landing back at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Good morning. This is today, and this Thursday is the first day of July. We started with a live picture of the Boston Harbor, where Harbor Fest 82 gets underway today. First annual commemoration, rich heritage of Boston Harbor, a heritage that includes the dumping of... Let Mission Control in Houston. Bob, good morning. Good morning, Heidi, and we have some very good news. Just a few minutes ago, that problem was solved. The astronauts managed to close the payload bay doors. So the difficulties that Columbia was having yesterday have been solved. Yesterday, during tests of the effects of the sun on the spacecraft, some of the latches on the payload bay doors jammed, and this led to concern that they might not be able to be closed properly for landing. But everything has been fixed, and we have some pictures from space. That's, uh, that's a familiar sight. The astronauts turned their camera out the window and showed a spectacular picture of Florida, looking north to the right of the screen and south to the left. That's Lake Okeechobee in the middle, Cape Canaveral sticking down into the Atlantic, the Space Shuttle Columbia uh, has begun its first journey, but this one is kind of at a plodding three miles an hour. The shuttle Challenger is being towed from its Rockwell International Assembly facility in Palmdale, California, to Edwards Air Force Base for the landing. It'll be there for Columbia's landing on Sunday. The 53-mile trek is expected to take about 12 hours today. The shuttle made its debut yesterday when Rockwell officials turned Challenger over to NASA. The new ship will be scrapped to a 747 then on Sunday and flown back to Cape Canaveral where it will be ready for its maiden flight. That'll come up in January. Along with the closing of the cargo doors and they solved the problem with a short in their toilet. They also got a little exercise in today. Meanwhile, the next space shuttle, the Challenger, was delivered to Edwards Air Force Base in California. It's going to fly piggyback on a 747 to Florida, stopping in Houston at Ellington Air Force Base for refueling on Sunday. They're landing on Sunday, July 4th. The problem with one of the payload bay doors ended when the latches were warmed by the sun, and the astronauts are keeping up with their onboard assignments. Henry Hartsfield was on an exercise machine as part of a test to see what happens to the astronauts' cholesterol levels during space flight. And on the ground in California, Challenger, the new orbiter, made a bizarre appearance in Lancaster as it was slowly rolled through town to Edwards Air Force Base nearby. This team is ready. Jeff Levine, CNN, Gainesville, Florida. Trip to the Cape, new deluxe model carries room for three more astronauts and provisions for a kitchen, a galley. In Washington, the idea... This is today, it's a Friday, the second day of July, and you are looking on at one fine idea of William Penn. He arrived here on the good ship Welcome from England. Earth after a week in space. But the space shuttle Columbia is not due to come down until the 4th of July. And astronauts Ken Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield have already been at work today for several hours. Bob Bazell reports live now from the Johnson Space Center in Texas. Bob? Chris, good morning. It's very crowded up there in space. The Columbia passed 7.7 .7 miles this morning from a piece of space garbage. It went right near a discarded Soviet rocket booster. And in fact, that's one of thousands of things like that that are orbiting around the Earth. Flight controllers here at Johnson Space Center studied the situation and decided not to change Columbia's orbit. The astronauts were told to look for that rocket booster. They didn't see anything. 
everything on this last test flight of the Columbia continues to go very well, and there's every indication that very soon shuttle flights will become as routine as airline trips. We have some pictures from space. This is Commander Ken Mattingly. He's standing there in the space suit that on the next mission, astronauts will use for extra vehicular activity, as they call it. They'll go through that airlock in the background there and take a walk around in space. That's not planned for this mission, but they're just testing out the space suit. These pictures came in minutes ago. Here we have uh, Henry Hartsfield, the pilot, in the pilot seat, giving a, that's not the pilot seat, excuse me, that's the back of the spacecraft where they operate the robot arms, giving a demonstration of the various switches and nozzles and other things that he uses to manipulate that arm. And here we have Hartsfield again on the treadmill. This is the exercise device that the astronauts use to keep in shape. The straps around their shoulders hold them down to it because since there's no gravity up there, if they didn't have something to hold them against it, they would just float away. That thing was broken this morning. I, I don't know if they've gotten it fixed yet, but the astronauts have reported that they really enjoy this, this exercise, although it doesn't look exactly like a lot of fun. It was on the menu for Soviet cosmonauts aboard the Salyut 7 space station when they were visited by a French pilot. That Frenchman and the two Soviet cosmonauts in space are now back on the ground leaving two cosmonauts remaining at the space station. CNN's Peter Hume has more on today's landing by the Frenchman and the two Russians. The entire return procedure took just a few hours to complete, as the three-man Soyuz crew, including Frenchman Jean-Luc Chrétien, bid farewell from the entrance to their space capsule. Colleagues Anatoly Berezovoy and Valentin Lebedev embraced their companions and took souvenir snaps. Soviet Mission Control said Friday that the cosmonauts had carried out all experiments as planned during the seven-day joint research period involving both crews. Observers say the most important aspect of the research was probably the continuous monitoring of the crew's vital organs and circulation, designed to test the human body's ability to withstand extended periods in weightlessness, which would be an important factor in any long-term space exploration project. The uncoupling of the two craft appeared to happen smoothly, and the Soyuz capsule floated slowly away from the Salyut space lab. Western scientists say the mission was essentially of the same type that has been carried out by the Soviets on nine previous occasions, and point out that Chrétien was only a guest in what remained very much a Russian program. Despite these claims, several of the experiments on board Salyut were carried out on French-built equipment. And another Gallic contribution, which proved popular amongst the Soviet crewmen, was a special nine-pound payload of French food. Soviet television news reports followed the return of the capsule throughout the day, and showed scientists at mission control rising to their feet and applauding at the moment of the actual landing in the northern Kazakhstan province in Soviet Central Asia. Initial medical reports from doctors who had rushed to the area were quoted as stating that the three cosmonauts were all in good condition and were feeling well. No date has been announced yet, however, for the return of the two Salyut crew members, who have now been in orbit for nearly two months. In the window and saw a man floating by, in a lawn chair, suspended from 42 weather balloons, frantically shooting at his balloons with a BB gun, and talking on a radio. A radio club member on the ground heard him saying, Mayday, Mayday, and complaining that Having launched himself for a balloon ride, he had shot up like an elevator to 16,000 feet and was getting numb. He was lucky. By the time he dropped his BB gun, he'd already shot enough balloons to let him descend, very close to some power lines over which the balloons draped themselves, leaving 33-year-old Larry Walters dangling in his lawn chair a few feet off the ground. Well, he got down fine, having fulfilled a dream having provoked the Federal Aviation Administration, which is looking for something to charge him with, and leaving his girlfriend with the lasting memory of Larry's voice on the CB radio when, as she put it, he went up into the clouds, heard engines of airplanes, he couldn't see them and they couldn't see him, and he went, oh my goodness. That's it for this evening. I'm John Hart. They'll bring the space shuttle back down to Earth, completing its fourth successful manned mission. For more on this, let's go to Susan Starnes, who's live at the Johnson Space Center. Susan? Dan, Columbia is scheduled to land at 11.09 Houston time at Edwards Air Force Base in California. You may remember on the last launch, they had a sudden sandstorm in New Mexico, and that delayed the landing by one day. But there are no curveballs expected from Mother Nature this time. 
Patriotic gestures are synonymous with the 4th of July. Just after the sun rose in Houston this morning, astronauts Tom Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield were paying tribute to the thousands of people who helped put them into orbit. My hats are really off to the people who built this spacecraft and made it work. My hats are off to all you people down there that have uh, worked to keep us up here and keep the flight going smoothly. And uh, we just wanted to let you know how much we appreciate it. <laughs> Although there have been no dramatic developments during this shuttle flight, that has not kept people away from the Johnson Space Center. Thousands braved the heat today to see the many exhibits. Thousands are expected tomorrow at Ellington Air Force Base when Challenger lands about 445 for a refueling stop. And of course, the astronauts will come home to Ellington about 6 o'clock tomorrow night. Gates will open at Ellington to let the uh, public in to view both Challenger and see the astronauts come home at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. We'll be there with live reports all day long. Susan Starnes, Channel 2 News, reporting live from the Johnson Space. Have a happy 4th, by the way. Again, we'd like to remind you that over 100,000 people are expected at Ellington tomorrow to witness it all. We'd like to point out that if you do plan to be there, you should know that only the main gate to Ellington on Farm Road 1959 will be open to the public. Secondly, State Highway 3 will be closed at the intersections of Farm Road 2351 and 2553, so make plans to avoid that area. The base will open to the public at 2 in the afternoon until 8 p.m. I'm Charles Kuralt, and this is Sunday Morning. We have a song of America to sing on the morning of the 4th of July, but not a song of celebration only. It seems to us far more patriotic on our national day, in a story about baseball, for example, to remember those great old players. The Air Force Base, where they're expecting a very big crowd today. You can't actually see the crowds in the pictures we have because, of course, the people kept some distance from the actual landing site. I think right? they're back about five miles from the runway. Well, here we see, uh, well, this is this is the actual runway, is it? Uh, what is it we're seeing now, Terry? Well, there's the ramp. Uh, we're looking over toward the, uh, the concrete ramp at Dryden Air Force Base. The runway, I believe, is just to the left of those hangars. And uh, we're coming in, I guess, for the first of the concrete runway landings from space. Um, what does that mean? Is there getting any change of plans or anything uh, uh, that you'll be especially looking for there? There's not so much difference in the surface, Kevin. Uh, the reason we've landed on the lake beds thus far is because it gives us much more room for air on these uh, initial landings. Uh, it turned out we didn't need it. All the landings have been uh, within a couple thousand feet of where we thought they'd be. But uh, just for a safety margin, we chose to do that. Now, of course, we have to prepare for landing at Cape Canaveral, and uh, we'll be doing that today by landing on a runway, which is very similar to the one at, at the Cape. Well, the stage is now set at Edwards in California, where the uh, shuttle will really be the start of this 4th of July landing. And as CNN's Larry Lamont reports, the audience is filing in, the supporting cast is watching the weather, and all that remains is the arrival of the principal. So wanted to land the shuttle with a crosswind so they could ten, uh, test Columbia's responses. But it turns out that it's somewhat calmer here today, so they will likely touch down instead on the concrete runway, that's runway 22, the one you're seeing. And this will be the first landing that is not on the wide expanse of the desert lake bed. Waiting out there to greet them will be President Reagan, who is expected to arrive here very shortly to watch and then to speak. And another big attraction here at Edwards, Challenger, Columbia's sister ship, the second orbiter, mounted atop the jumbo jet and ready for its very first trip to the Cape. It's going to take off a little bit later as part of this very special 4th of July show. I'll be here along with our friend and colleague, Apollo astronaut Gene Cernan, and we'll bring you all the pictures and all the details. Frank? Thank you, Lynn. So we wait now, but not for long, for Columbia to come back from space for the fourth time. Ken Mattingly and Hank Hartsfield are now still far out over the Pacific, but are set to touch down at Edwards Air Force Base at 11 minutes after the hour. And we'll come back on the hour, 9 o'clock, in California and 12 noon here on the East Coast to bring you live coverage of Columbia. So, well, what stage of the, as I believe it's called, the downhill trip is it in now, Terry? It hasn't quite reached the atmosphere yet, Kevin. They've done the deorbit burn, and the uh, orbit that they're in now intersects the atmosphere uh, right around Hawaii. 
They've just left the Guam tracking station uh, about two minutes ago. And we may be able to, to uh, break through the, the blackout uh, ionization over Hawaii, and there, there may be about a one-minute uh, uh, time where, where the uh, mission control team will be able to talk to the shuttle. No, blackout ionization. Uh, did you unpack that a bit? That means that, that's when you cut, you're out of radio contact. Well, I'll try a little bit. The, the shuttle, of course, uh, at orbital velocity, is moving about 17,700 miles per hour, and that speed's required to stay in orbit. Uh, the crew did the deorbit burn. They slowed down by just about 200 miles an hour a very small difference uh, from the total speed, but that's enough to cause the orbit to come into the atmosphere. And when the shuttle hits the atmosphere at those tremendous velocities, it heats up the air around there, and, and that provides a shield uh, through which radio communications is difficult. In Queens, for the landing, which is now about uh, 12 minutes away. Just distinguish the shape now. This this picture is coming from what? Is this from a ground camera? Or is that from the first PK you are go? This would be from our ground camera, uh, Kevin. I think it's at the Vandenberg Air Force Base. That was a go for the push over the solar. Yes, I guess the, the steadiness uh, would suggest it's obviously a ground based camera. So in that case, pretty soon we'll be getting the first uh, close up of the planes who are moving in toward the, uh, the shuttle now, right? That's right, and uh, all through this phase here, uh, Ken Mattingly is taking manual control of the orbiter and performing uh, test maneuvers, a deliberate perturbations to the flight path of Columbia to uh, gather more aerodynamic data. So we're in one of the, uh, we're in the middle of the, the S now, or coming into the middle of the S now? We appear to be in a right turn here, if I see the attitude correctly, we can just see the tail of the uh, Columbia uh, pointing up toward the left, so they're in a right-hand turn. They were just given a go by uh, Brewster Shaw, the Capcom of Mission Control, to uh, accept the navigation okay, facility uh, at Edwards, the pac facility. The exchanges that we did between uh, Houston and the orbiter suggest to you that everything is uh, proceeding smoothly? Yes, they were slightly high on energy, uh, Brewster said, and uh, slightly south of the nominal ground track. That's typically uh, because of these test maneuvers uh, that uh, Commander Manley has, has done, uh, caused the ground track to go a little bit off of nominal. We might even drop on some of those exchanges now. Thanks, sir. Me and the one of the... This is an ABC News special report. The return of the Space Shuttle Columbia. ABC News continuing coverage of Reach into Space. Now from Washington, David Brinkley. We would like to welcome those stations joining us at this point. The Space Shuttle Columbia is now approaching Edwards Air Force Base in... It seems now to be climbing. What is this maneuver? Uh, I think that's because the camera is really on the uh, on the west coast itself. It's um, quite a ways from uh, Edwards Air Force Base. The president has greeted returning astronauts since Richard Nixon met the Apollo 11 crew on a carrier off Hawaii 13 years ago. Also here, what looks to be coastline of California. And doesn't that baby look nice? He's only about uh, nine or ten minutes really away from a touchdown. That's a long-range camera and the uh, space shuttle is still a hundred miles or so away from the actual touchdown point. Touchdown in eight minutes and 34 seconds. She's just crossed the coastline, actually just south of Santa Barbara, and will continue straight on, almost on a direct line to Edwards Air Force Base, where there is a large crowd waited to, uh, waiting to greet the astronauts, including, of course, President Reagan, who will be out there today, arrived a short while ago. These are really the first uh, shots we've had now of the Space Shuttle Columbia since uh, she roared off the pad just about exactly one week ago and an hour uh, from the, today, last Sunday at uh, Cape Kennedy and the now familiar spectacular launch. And the Columbia has now successfully gone around the Earth, completed its mission flawlessly. And uh, we have lost the picture for just a moment. But we've already had uh, reacquisition of signal. The space uh, 
craft is in communication with the ground and they've been given the clear clearance for landing here at Edwards Air Force Base on runway 22. So now we want to bring in our correspondents who are there at uh, the uh, Edwards Air Force Base. First of all, we'll get a quick glimpse of the president under an umbrella there, a sunshade. He and Mrs. Reagan are there on the uh, special platform that's been erected for them to uh, watch the return of the Columbia. And here's some of the crowd. We're told there are more than 300,000 people scattered all around this huge, sprawling complex to try to get a glimpse of Columbia as she comes down. Lee, uh, he hasn't said much, but he's certainly done a lot up there, hasn't he? Well, this has been an outstanding... And uh, Dick Truly will be the commander who was the pilot on the... On you can probably hear a little band music in the background. Uh, a lot of people here waving a lot of flags. It's going to be a little bit different from what we've seen before. And Gene Cernan, it's a lot different from White Sands. Frank, it's a great day for a birthday party. Everyone here is in a jubilant spirit. As Lynn said, the flags are flying, the president's here, and we're all waiting for the return of Columbia to come home. And that will happen before long. You're not very far away from hearing the old sonic boom, are you, as she goes over? We ought to. We ought to. We expect to hear that boom. Uh, I think we'll hear it probably in the next two or three minutes because the uh, Columbia has crossed the coastline and uh, she'll be landing here in about uh, six more minutes. Everybody here, by the way, Frank, uh, is going to be informed of all these things. They have imported Hugh Harris, who is the voice of launch control. He is out here telling all the visitors, the very important visitors, exactly what to expect. This is also something new for this return of Columbia. There's a huge banner. I don't know if you've seen it yet over on one of the hangars saying, welcome home, Columbia, and certainly everybody here feels that way. Well, it certainly is a, a grand occasion for, the, uh, for NASA to have the president there, to have the touchdown come on the 4th of July. Here's our graphic showing that we have five minutes and 40 seconds or so to go. Uh, there you can see it now once again. Again, this is from a camera, I believe, at Edwards. It's 44 miles away, I'm told, from touchdown. Seems to be just gliding through the sky. And, of course, Columbia is, at this point, really, a glider. You know, they don't have an opportunity to make more than one pass at the uh, landing strip. And on this uh, particular landing, they will come down on runway 22, which is the concrete one way. That will be the first time. It's some 15,000 feet long and about uh, 300 feet wide. But it has plenty of desert on either side and at either end of it. So the uh, runway landing here will not quite be uh, the same as landing at Kennedy uh, Space Center in Florida, which, of course, is what eventually will happen on uh, future shuttle flights. Gee, that's Frank, a pretty sight. Frank, it, uh, when we were told earlier in Houston uh, by Harold Drawn, one of the flight directors, that there is a, a bit of a psychological barrier to the astronauts coming down on that concrete runway. But uh, Gene Cernan, of course, astronaut pilot Gene Cernan, uh, had some different feelings about whether concrete would be a psychological barrier. Oh, uh, Lynn, uh, you know, they don't have the entire expanse of the desert to land in, and it's sort of, I, I looked at it as coming home to an aircraft carrier. You know exactly where it's going to be, and you better be on it, and I think that's the way Ken looks at it. Even though they don't have that long runoff that they would have with these piles of sand out here. Well, once they see their target and they've got the spacecraft under control, which they obviously do at this time, uh, I think we're going to see a pretty smooth Navy landing again. <laughs> Gene, the angle of descent now, they're really coming down fast, aren't they? The, of course, the, the vehicle is a glider. The spacecraft is a glider. It doesn't have very large wings. As a result, it, it has to maintain a lot of speed to manage its energy. And, and we will see a very steep descent, uh, as we have looked at in the past. We're still seeing uh, it should be about overhead. It's 10 miles away, and it'll just be a matter of uh, 10 or 15 seconds before we may very well pick up that sonic boom. And you haven't yet uh, been able to see it? No, we haven't. There, oh! there we go. How's that for timing, Frank? <laughs> just she just went seconds. over the top, obviously. I think that's about as loud as we've ever had yeah, it here. I'm getting good after a little practice. <laughs> well, now we can see the, the, heading, the line president and everybody now. else looking up there. Starting he's got it in view. Frank, I, I think we... I think we do have some contrails of it, uh, just to the southwest of us over here. There it is. Now you can see the contrail of the uh, shuttle itself. We have a very good visual. Uh, it's oh, yes. just, a, just a tremendous day now, and I think that's a chase plane camera. One chase plane camera up there with a train this time. Used to be two, but the one is providing excellent coverage, as you can see. Gene, is it in the big left turn now, swinging around? It, it's in a big sweeping left-hand turn, and what it's doing is uh, is uh, losing some of its altitude, maintaining a proper speed, so it has, again, enough energy to make the runway. This is a very critical phase of the maneuver. It, it will be uh, reaching out about 10 to 15 miles away before it turns back in. 
Frank, this uh, concrete runway, as you probably know, is a, a bit further off than runway 23, where it's landed the previous two times here at Edwards. So we are not going to get quite as wonderful a visual sighting as we had before. The picture we're seeing here is of the president. I noticed, by the way, that as soon as that sonic boom hit and the uh, spacecraft came into sight, everybody got up off the seats. They were uh, sitting down before. Oh, you can see the contrails now, just behind the... Uh, 18,000 feet now. The spacecraft. Frank, the president 18. is on a platform with uh, several uh, astronauts who have already flown in the shuttle. Let's see if we can't pick up more communications now between the spacecraft and the ground. He's being well briefed out there by previous well, shuttle pilots. turning into a heading uh, lined up with the runway now. He should be in automatic uh, control at this point in time and will probably maintain it down through feet. about uh, 200 feet. 14,000 feet. Third airspeed 264. I still can't get over that, Frank. The idea of being an automatic and bringing it down right to the deck before he takes over. 12,000 feet. Look at the little chase plane alongside. It's always a beautiful sight. Should be lined up with the runway, turning uh, in on what we might, what we call final at this point in time, but she's still about uh, six, seven miles away. 9,600 feet, 282 knots. Ah, it's just auto land here. guidance now. This is what the Commander Only Mattingly has referred to as that magic so machine called the shuttle. Feet. Look at the escort. <laughs> now, Frank, you can see how steeply she comes. Ken Mattingly will take over at uh, 2,500 feet for the landing. Okay, he's in automatic guidance. He'll be taking over manually here to uh, land the aircraft uh, with stick and rudders like normal airplanes are landed. 280 knots at uh, 4,200 feet. 3,000. 2,200 feet. He should have it manually. He's still at uh, well over 200 knots when he touches down. The fans are cheering. Americans are cheering out here. This is really a great birthday party. They're getting a play-by-play -play on the loudspeakers, too. And is the president going to get a view? There's the landing oh, here. She came right. out. Yeah. There it is. Go down. She'll Not just down. gently come down. Keep it coming, Ken. Keep it coming. He's a little Gears fast. Down and like. Stand by for touchdown. There it is. Touchdown. There's the dust. The nose will come down gently, and this time I expect it'll stay down. Not like the last time, when it suddenly reared up again, yeah. Outstanding job. Outstanding. <laughs> he heard you, Gene. He heard you. That's Brewster Shaw, the Capcom, echoing that. Outstanding. Well, let's see how much runway he uses now. Shuttle control here, the unofficial landing time, seven days, one hour, nine minutes, 40 seconds. We were to about repeat to... the unofficial landing time, seven days, one hour, nine minutes, 40 seconds. Well, we're about 14 <laughs> seconds early, but we lifted off on time, Frank. Lift, lifted off 135 milliseconds early, Frank. Came down 13 seconds early. Has he still got some runway left? He's got a ways to go. There you see the president yes. with that. You see Bob Crippen, uh, who was on STS-1, just punched the air when that came down. He was real happy. He's got his own craft going up, uh, STS-7. He'll be commanding. This is a pretty good way to impress the commander-in-chief. Ah, he's come to a stop. Well, that was a hard service runway, I think, which is a, another milestone, Frank, in the development of the, uh, of the usefulness of the shuttle. Uh, that says we can come down on hard service runways, and there's a lot of them around the world to land in if we have to. Actually, they were uh, unable to make use of uh, the opportunity that they wanted uh, to bring it down on a crosswind landing. That well, a crosswind again. landing is probably the one single thing left from this test uh, phase, but as I understand, uh, the shuttle's going to be landing here, uh, both Columbia and then Challenger, for the next couple landings, and I think they'll get a shot at it. This, of course, makes it operational, Frank. This is uh, the end of the test flights for Columbia. Sunset. Looks like the old days of the uh, American program again. One difference. Up in a, in one a fellow difference. in a space suit one, in a one bus. One difference, though. Snow. No, snow, <laughs> but they also got no, their helmets are open. That's true. And they're breathing normal air. And not until the shuttle did they ever see an American astronaut walking to a space launch with his helmet off. You get to pre-breathe oxygen before all the Apollo and Gemini and Mercury flights. And a very mysterious looking, mm. awe-inspiring shot as the And deliberately so. Of they, course. They, in the past, they, in fact, it took 10 years after this rocket first flew before we ever saw a picture of it. We've had other other spacecraft are there is even the launch of the Salyut space station has never been released. 
It's still totally secret what that booster looks like. Here we are upstairs. That's ice, that's ice from the uh, liquid oxygen inside the tank. Mm -hmm. And the Czech uh, cosmonauts are telling everyone how nice it is that they're part of the communist bloc of countries and they can fly into, into space once like this and wave the flag and uh, make the mission. But it really was a symbolic uh, gesture. Here we go. It's an evening launch, just like the uh, French launch was also an evening mm -hmm. launch. And it would have looked much like this if we had seen it. And off we go. And as we said, sometime this year, 1982, the 1,000th launch of this kind of vehicle is going to take place. Now, why is it so unusual? This, this scene here strikes me as so, uh, it's, it's almost eerie to see how close their mission control mm -hmm. looks to ours. Uh, the, the seats, the, uh, the scanning uh, Here we are, lines opening up the hatch. And this two, is a two, two men on board already. Two uh -huh. men have been up there for, at this point, about uh, three months, and now they're getting these visitors. <clears throat> uh, yeah, the control center does look much like ours. The difference being that their map has a different continent in the center. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and also they go farther north and south in the orbit. There we go, typical frolicking in, in zero gravity. That's the seat that there, the uh, view we just saw a few minutes ago, the fellow, yeah, the that's right. Slovak the, fellow the crawling in. That's right, in, right. Under, under 1G, not deliberately. They're in the snow. And here. they come down, just before touchdown, there's a small solid rocket fire and it slows them down. It works quite nicely. They've got lots of space out there, uh, a, lot, a lot of land, rather, and they can come down and be recovered fairly safely. And, uh, and uh, Terry Cotton, I hear our uh, scene pictures. You see now the President and the First Lady have arrived and are uh, very close by, and uh, I think we're seeing the return of the astronauts. First glimpse we have of them as they uh, very lightly Walk down the stairs, no problems at all with gravity. A great um, burst of applause there from the crowd and uh, the official presidential greeting. That was Ken Mattingly down the ladder first there. I, I would say they moved rather briskly. Yes, uh, they certainly seem to have recovered uh, their gravity legs very quickly. Be, uh, um, making sure that we safely shut down all the uh, appropriate systems. Always careful any time handling the vehicle to, to make sure we don't damage anything. Uh, Canaveral, Florida, for its first mission, which will come in January. So there is the second uh, of the orbiter spacecraft. And here is the uh, one that was the prototype of the uh, spacecraft. This is the Enterprise, the one that was uh, used for those simulated missions, carried aloft on uh, top of a 747 and then dropped in order to test the uh, landing capabilities of the uh, spacecraft. Here are the space shuttle. Cloud waving American flags. We understand there are some 30,000 folks out there in the hot sun. Among them, Gene Cernan and Lynn Scherr. Frank, I think these people are as excited to hear the president as they are to see the landing and to see the Challenger take off. Gene and I have been awed watching it go by on top of the 747. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. TK and Hank, you can see we've gotten well acquainted already. You've just given the American people a 4th of July present to remember. I think all of us, all of us who've just witnessed the magnificent sight of the Columbia touching down in the California desert feel a real swelling of pride in our chests. In the early days of our republic, Americans watched Yankee clippers glide across the many oceans of the world, manned by proud and energetic individuals, breaking records for time and distance, showing our flag and opening up new vistas of commerce and communications. Well, today, I think you have helped recreate the anticipation and excitement felt in those home ports as those gallant ships were spotted on the horizon heading in after a long voyage. Today, we celebrate the 206th anniversary of our independence. Through our history, we've never shrunk before a challenge. The conquest of new frontiers for the betterment of our homes and families is a crucial part of our national character. 
something which you so ably represent today. The space program in general and the shuttle program in particular have gone a long way to help our country recapture its spirit of vitality and confidence. The pioneer spirit still flourishes in America. In the future, as in the past, our freedom, independence, and national well-being will be tied to new achievements, new discoveries, and pushing back new frontiers. The fourth landing of the Columbia is the historical equivalent to the driving of the Golden Spike, which completed the first transcontinental railroad. It marks, it marks the, our entrance into a new era. The test flights are over. The groundwork has been laid. And now we will move forward to capitalize on the tremendous potential offered by the ultimate frontier of space. Beginning with the next flight, the Columbia and her sister ships will be fully operational, ready to provide economical and routine access to space for scientific exploration commercial ventures, and for tasks related to the national security. Simultaneously, we must look aggressively to the future by demonstrating the potential of the shuttle and establishing a more permanent presence in space. We've, we've only peered over the edge of our accomplishments. Yet the American people keep reaping the benefits of space and to provide a general direction for our future efforts. I recently approved a national space policy statement which is being released today. Our goals for space are ambitious yet achievable. They include continued space activity for economic and scientific benefits, expanding private investment and involvement in space-related activities, promoting international uses of space, cooperating with other nations to maintain the freedom of space for all activities that enhance the security and welfare of mankind, strengthening our own security by exploring new methods of using space as a means of maintaining the peace. There are those who thought the closing of the Western frontier marked an end to America's greatest period of vitality. Yet we're crossing new frontiers every day. The high technology now being developed, much of it by byproduct of the space effort, offers us and future generations of Americans opportunities never dreamed of a few years ago. Today, we celebrate American independence, confident that the limits of our freedom and prosperity have again been expanded by meeting the challenge of the frontier. We also honor to pathfinders. They reaffirm to all of us that as long as there are frontiers to be explored and conquered, Americans will lead the way. <laughs> they and the other astronauts have shown the world that Americans still have the know-how and Americans still have the true grit that tackled a savage wilderness. Charles Lindbergh once said that short-term survival may depend on the knowledge of nuclear physicists and the performance of supersonic aircraft, but long-term survival depends alone on the character of man. That, too, is our challenge. Hank and TK, we're proud of you. We need not fear for the future of our nation as long as we've got men like you to serve as our inspiration. You can't see, but way out there on the end of the runway, the Space Shuttle Challenger, affixed atop a 747, is about to start on the first leg of a journey that will eventually put it into space in November. It's headed for Florida now, and I believe they're ready to take off. Challenger, you are free to take off now. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce to you two sons of Auburn, Captain T.K. Mattingly and Colonel Hank Hartsfield.
Thank you. Mr. President, you, uh, you mentioned something about people having a desire to maintain a presence in space. Not very many hours ago, I know two guys who really wanted to maintain that presence in space a while longer. <laughs> that is, uh, you never get tired of it. The most remarkable thing, besides the machine and the team that put it together, is that it's a new discovery every minute and every day. The machine we built is a first stepping stone. Here comes the second one. We're standing in front of its pathfinder, and there's more to come. Where we're going to go in the future is something that depends on you. mission this holiday and now the next go will be drawing plans for a permanently staffed space station president reagan hailed the landing as a new era in space travel thousands were on hand for this historic event both in california where the shuttle landed and here in houston where the astronauts returned home 747 jumbo jet <laughs> loud applause and cheers greeted both the astronauts and that magnificent side of the challenger the 747 made a pass of Ellington right in front of the cheering crowd. The astronauts waited for the Challenger to come to a stop before speaking. It's really been a privilege over the last number of years to watch this program grow from a piece of paper to something that I can now say I've flown in. You have no idea how magnificent this spacecraft is. Every minute you're up there, you see something new. And all these little kids... They're going to think of things to do in the future, and they're going to go see things that you and I have never even dreamed of. None of this could have happened without all the work that a lot of you folks put in and, and folks across the country. It's all a team effort, and I guess some of us, they get, are fortunate enough to fly the thing, get a little bit of the tension, but really the tension should belong to all you folks, because it couldn't happen without you. This was the second gates opened at two o'clock in the afternoon and for the next several hours it was a steady flow of cars the concrete seemed to soak up the heat it must have been more than 100 degrees at ground level many of these people work in the space program they're among the thousands who individually have a small part but together play a major role in the mission Others don't work on the shuttle program, but said they wanted to be a part of the welcome for the astronauts and for the most magnificent 4th of July show Houstonians will ever see. First, a couple of local guys coming home from a 2.9 million mile trip, the Challenger. As the crowd watched it taxi up atop a Boeing 747, NASA executive Dr. Hans Mark told the crowd the best is yet to come. The next step, ladies and gentlemen, is to establish a permanent presence in space.